are the kings of the Australian outback. You've got to concentrate all the time. Some of the biggest trains in the world. If things go wrong with these things, normally makes a big mess. On epic journeys through a hostile continent. I don't know what we're going to do. Just slow down and blow the horn. A nation depends on them. Oh well God, boys, get in line. And the teams that keep these metal monsters on the tracks. Yeah! Hauling huge loads of food, freight and mineral riches across incredible distances. We are out in the middle of nowhere, that's for sure. Big trains, big country. Railroad Australia. So it'll be all guns blazing shortly. Four hours to fix a faulty track. We've got to be careful, coordinate everything, not get in each other's way. Fail, and it could cost millions. It's an incredibly tight period to do it in. A freight train with fuel problems. I can actually see the locomotive in fueling mode and then cutting out. I got no power in here. The worst place in the world to run out of juice. And keeping an outback icon on the rails. If something's wrong, it's my head on the chopping block. Introducing the undisputed heavyweight champions of the train world. Australia's giant iron ore cans. 2.8 kilometres long. 38,000 tonnes worth of iron ore. They thunder through the iron-rich outback of northwestern Australia, hauling mountains of ore. From the mines of the Pilbara region, 300 kilometres to ships waiting at Port Hedland, bound for China. It's an industry worth billions of dollars the engine of the nation's economy. Each train would have to have a value of, uh, in the ballpark of three and a half million dollars, four million dollars. So we're talking some serious, serious, serious money. The world's heaviest trains, owned by mining giant Fortescue, take a heavy toll on the track. When the rails need fixing, it means a shutdown. A maintenance shut, we are talking tens of thousands of dollars a minute. It's about to happen. After this last train goes through, a 60-strong team will swing into action. It's imperative there's minimal disruption. Taking advantage of a scheduled maintenance shutdown, they have just four hours to replace a 73-metre section of track known as a turnout. It's where trains pass each other. Machines that can slice through the heavy steel rail will be needed, as well as heavy duty cranes to lift the new section into place. We'll immediately start cutting the track and then the diggers on that side will start pulling, pulling the turnout down. When they get the go ahead, it all has to run like clockwork. The diggers will then climb up and they'll start levelling if it doesn't, the consequences are huge. The numbers stagger. It takes six of these trains to fill a ship, with ore that's worth more than $10 million. Three of these ships sail every 24 hours. Yeah, Jim, we're uh, ready to take uh, track access authority. Yeah. A call goes through to train control. And now he's just waiting for the track access authority to generate on the computer. The team has to get official possession of the track before they can get to work. Once we've got all the track down, we've got the, got the ballast leveled, then the crane lift will happen. Roger control, that's track access authority number 0102. This is it. Now, we've got the possession now, so we start our time now, and we're going to aim for four hours.
It's the bare minimum time for a job this size. But the line mustn't be closed for any longer. A rule of thumb that an hour of the uh, track occupancy was equivalent to about a million dollars. So every hour is down was about a million dollars wasted. From northwestern Australia, 1,600 kilometres south to Perth. Shunters are working late into the night to put together the final wagons of a 1.8 kilometre mega train. With a marathon journey ahead of it. 2,700 kilometres to go. Phil Garrod and Darren Blakes are two of the four drivers that will work in relay to take the train virtually non-stop across the vast emptiness of the bottom half of Australia. 6pm9 is heading over the continent to Adelaide and on to Melbourne. All up a 3,000 kilometre journey that will take three days. 4,133 tonne and we've got 76 wagons. So she's a pretty big train going back. 1,795 metres. Here, 6 pm 9, we're ready to depart. Over. Are you departing the emergency Watch all episodes of Ice Pilots. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Bailey now. I'll get you some lights in a moment there, over. Righto, thank you. To eliminate fuel stops on the trip, the train tows two tanker loads of diesel, more than 50,000 litres, fed automatically to the engines. Uh, SCT 12 receiving. But the grind of one of the world's toughest rail journeys puts big pressure on the inline system. Yeah, just want to know how your fuel levels are going on your uh, low cart there, mate. Drivers have reported problems with it. System technician Gary Aitken is riding to Adelaide to see what's going wrong. I've got a remote set up on the actual locomotive control box and that's sending a signal to my laptop just telling me exactly what that locomotive is doing. At the dawn crew change the following morning, they're more than 600 kilometres east of Perth. Good progress, but the rest of the trip is not looking so easy. I said the machine doesn't work. Yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, OK. The automatic fueling system has continued to malfunction throughout the night. Gary Aitken still can't solve the problem. Just when you're going to, when it's finished, and when oh. you have it like a bump or a... Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, At the start of the next shift, it's a problem new drivers, Cookie and Ryan, will have to grapple with. And it's not one you want heading into this part of the world. From the Nullarbor Plain, across the continent to Port Augusta in South Australia. It's the famous outback train that refuses to die. Still full of life. After nearly a century of operation. The original GAN service. The train that conquered the desert between Adelaide and Alice Springs. Connecting Australia's red centre with the southern states. And it's still running today. Not quite as far, but with just as much fanfare. From Port Augusta in South Australia, 40 kilometres north to the township of Corn and back again. Pioneers started this line. Volunteers keep it going. I'm a Thomas Tank Engine fan gone wrong. So my train sets just got bigger as I got older, you know. The train guard is 21-year-old Ben Grafey. The safety and the efficient running of the train, the running on time, all that kind of stuff is, is all on me. Engine number NM25, 
If anything goes wrong, the rail regulator comes to what I've done first, has a look at all of my paperwork and all that kind of stuff, and if something's wrong, it's my head on the chopping block. A full train is due out tomorrow. The rush is on to get everything prepared on time. Doing a uh, visual inspection of the, the firebox to make sure there's no, no leaks or weeps. It's a 150-year-old line and an 85-year-old train. Nothing can be left to chance. But there's one thing they can't control. The weather. And the forecast for tomorrow is for freakish conditions. Apparently we're going to experience the wildest, roughest, coldest weather we've seen in 25 to 30 years up in the Flinders Ranges. They're predicting snow is going to fall in the Flinders Ranges tonight. Transcontinental freight train 6pm9 is out on the Nullarbor Plain, far from civilization. Drivers Cookie and Ryan closely watching their worsening fuel situation. I think it's around 40,000 litres we use to go over and probably around 25 to get home. The automatic filling system that feeds the locos from tankers they're pulling is behaving erratically. If the fuel in the locos drops too low, they'll have to stop and fuel them manually. In the crew cabin, fuel technician Gary Aitken is trying to find the fault. I can see the locomotive requesting fuel and I can actually see the locomotive in fueling mode and then cutting out. The engines are thirsty. They burn more than 800 litres of diesel an hour, nearly 100 times more than the average car. At a short stop to let another train pass, Gary does some quick tests on the electrics. The train's on a strict schedule. He can't hold it up for too long. Manually pumping the fuel will mean extra stops and lost time, and plenty of it. But the alternative is much worse, running too low. You don't like letting it run too low because it starts picking up the rubbish on the bottom of the tank, and then that can start blocking filters and it can give you different problems later on. So we try and keep as much in as we can. Cookie's taking advantage of the stop to pump in as much diesel as he can manually. He doesn't have long. There's another massive freight train heading his way. He'll need to make sure he's clear by the time it comes through. Cookie's well clear by the time the freighter comes hurtling through. Gary still can't fix the problem. There's no more time. It's going to make it a bit awkward for the rest of the way home. But we're just going to have to stop. We're going to have to manually pump fuel in. And that knocks time out of us. Cookie gets 6 p.m. 9 going again while Ryan records their fuel consumption. Another two hours and we're seriously going to have to get some fuel into it. There's still 1,500 kilometres to go until Adelaide. Gary needs to find a solution to the fuel problem or they'll be stopping many more times. Freight worth hundreds of thousands of dollars won't be delivered in time. From halfway across the Nullarbor Plain, north to the iron ore mines of the Pilbara. The trains have stopped and the track maintenance workers are flat out. They have less than four hours to replace a 73 metre section of track. It's an incredibly tight period to do it in. I couldn't really sleep last night. The gang has to replace what's known as a turnout. The points that direct a train into a siding so another one 
American parts. Cutting that out at the moment and uh, just about to have the setting up the cranes. As they're getting ready to cut this out, the uh, excavators are on the other side there. And they're getting ready to pull this down the, the bank. Every person on the crew has their own job to do, and quickly. Some are in charge of heavy machinery. Others just have picks and shovels. It's tough work, made tougher by the looming deadline. After less than an hour of cutting, digging, scraping, it's time for the big boys to move in. The mission is to get the old line out of the way as fast as possible. Save it. We're not being gentle with it. We just want it out as quick as we can. It's a lightning fast demolition job. 100 tons, 73 metres of steel rail and concrete sleepers scraped off the rocky ballast. Next, graders move in to prep the base for the new section. Yeah, Michael, come back. Can you clean that cut all the way up? You're on height now. Three cranes wait to play their part. They are pretty heavy duty cranes. Uh, we've had to do a fair bit of earthworks for the cranes here. The rip out takes less than an hour, but that's the easy part. Lifting and lining up the new section requires precision and patience. The drivers of these huge ore trains trust their lives to these workers. They have to get this repair exactly right. Track maintenance is so important. Essentially, my life is in their hands. If I go across a, a broken rail joint or something like that, potentially they could have a derailment and potentially that, that could be, uh, you know, a catastrophic incident. Meanwhile, the trains are stopped and the meter is ticking over at a million dollars an hour. There's been a crew change on 6 p.m. 9. Darren and Phil are back up front. Take main line, cross 4 p.m. 4. The train pushes on into the vast expanse of the Nullarbor. This is the mine's probably a little bit away, a couple of minutes. What do you want, your vest in or not? Cookie and Ryan are relaxing in the crew car. Can't get better than that when you're in the middle of nowhere, steak and veg. And Gary is still trying to solve the fuel problem. Yeah, just checking to see what your fuel levels are up on that front loco, mate. The tanks are running low and they'll need to stop soon to fill them manually. One of the locomotives has been um, just malfunctioning electrically, um, so I'm just uh, remotely monitoring that on my laptop. If you, if you see it getting a bit erratic, just give us a call. The crew cabin is a mini hotel designed so the off-duty drivers can rest, eat and relax. People spend thousands of dollars to come out here to look at the view and we get to do it for free. But up front in the loco, the drivers have to be ever alert, ready for anything. Two years ago, in the dead of night, Darren was at the controls when disaster struck. So it was midnight, so it was totally dark, and it was rainy, so our headlights weren't that bright. As we kept going down the hill, we saw more and more water, and it sort of looked like, as we got down further, a couple of rivers, and we got a bit worried, and eventually, as we got to the bottom, the water was actually running across the track. We was already doing 95 to 100 kilometres an hour, so we both took a deep breath, and a bit worried about what's going to happen. When we first hit it, it was just like a bit of a bump, but uh, the guys that were in bed, they actually got thrown out of bed. We just saw trucks on their sides, wagons on their sides, the track washed away. What it was, it was a once in 100 year rain event, 
and all that water had run down the hill and had formed a big lake right at the bottom. So as our loco went over it, it allowed the water to push all the ballast through and uh, every time another set of wheels came over it, it made it worse until it just caused a big derailment. Darren and his crew were stranded for days. We just had to sit tight and it took them about two days before anyone could get out there because of the flooding and because of the isolation of it. Yeah, so we just slept in the coach as we normally would until they came to rescue us, basically. Eventually, they were flown out in a light plane. It took two weeks to clear the only track across the continent and get the trains running again. On this trip, the problem isn't water, it's fuel. The tanks on the locos are at worryingly low levels. At the next crew change, they'll have to manually pump in as much diesel as they can. That will mean more delays and less chance of getting this freight to its destination on time. In South Australia, torrential rain is the last thing that volunteers from the Pitchy Ritchie Rail Group want. From lighting the match to in steam is around about four hours. They're getting their vintage steam train fired up for a run into the outback with a full load of passengers. The wet will make the already difficult conditions more challenging. I've got to watch out for wheel slip. If I get excessive wheel slip, I can destroy the motion on the locomotive. Today, the welfare of the train and its passengers will be in the hands of the guard, Ben Grafey. It does feel a little bit unnerving because, you know, you've got the same responsibilities as someone that, that's actually getting the big bucks to do this, you know, we're all volunteers. The train's ready to go. Thanks and order. Always have a red flag in case something goes wrong. Ben's determined that it leaves exactly on time. We're only a tourist railway, but we say we're going to depart at 10.30, so we've got to depart at 10.30, and that's just how it is. One minute to go. Just keep check with conductor. You, everyone on board, Mr. Conductor. Ready for departure. All aboard. It's all aboard, except for the guard. Crossing is activated. Good. Yeah, we're going to get <laughs> Got to run back to my carriage. They can't go without him. The Pitchy Ritchie steam train is off on a ride into the past. Along a century-old route, the start of the original journey connecting Australia's south to its remote north. But it's far from a nostalgic trip for driver Neil and his crew. We're looking for any moisture. Any build-up of water along the track anywhere from overnight rain, which will cause it to slip. The line they're travelling on is old and cuts through some of the toughest country around, made more hazardous from the overnight rains. We'll take it a little bit more cautiously through the cuttings because there may have been some rock slips. It's an area where it's, it's formed of uh, large rocks and, and fine silt, so when it rains, it washes away the silt, exposes the rocks, and they tend to then slide down under their own self-weight after a while. So we'll keep an eye out. Squeezing through cuttings so narrow, you can touch the sides. At the back, Ben keeps a constant eye out for trouble. And I can observe the train. Um, quite effectively, keep an eye on things and make sure that nothing goes wrong. Trees on the line, kangaroos, sheep, all that kind of fun stuff. So if I'm watching what's going on, I can at least be a little bit prepared when something does go pear-shaped. It's an experience from another era, from the glory days of steam, when the railroad was sometimes the only road. But there's no time for daydreaming for Neil. He's still battling up a steep incline 
and making matters worse, the forecast rain has arrived. The driver has to be a little bit more sensitive with the controls in case the loco goes into a wheel slip. If the wheels slip, the train could lose momentum and stall. It's not far from the top of the rise. Suddenly... The spot of a tree down in front of us. One of the busiest mining railways in the country is closed. Trains pulling millions of dollars worth of iron ore are at a standstill. The line has been shut down, so a section can be replaced. On the track, there's a frenzy of activity. The guys are just doing their grading of the ballast at the moment. Turnout will go on top of that. Still lots to go. There's still the welding, the tamping, uh, and of course the crane lift to put the, the turnout in. Part one of this job was to rip and remove a 73 metre section of line. They have less than three hours to replace it, so the trains can start running again. Part two is preparing the base for the new track. The rock ballast that holds the rails in place needs to be perfectly flat. We'll get the bottom of the ballast level down so that we get the top rail level height, correct? And uh, yeah, once we level it all out, the guys will do a bit of hand digging, but mostly work with the diggers. This line is the strongest rail line there is. It has to be. It carries the heaviest trains in the world. The rails can support wagons each weighing up to 160 tonnes, 250 per train. The clock is ticking. We'll be doing a few activities at the same time so that we um, minimise the time. Three cranes are on standby to lift 100 tonnes of steel rail and concrete sleepers all in one piece. Swinging a piece of track this size, this weight, exactly into position, takes a lot of skill and a lot of lifting power. What it can't take is a lot of time. It'll be all guns blazing shortly. The guys will be keen. No one's sitting down, everyone's ready to go. If they get it wrong, they'll have to raise it and set it again. Two hours left, and the hardest part still to come. Back at the mine, million dollar ore trains are standing idle. That costs money. Cookie and Ryan are back on the night shift on the SCT train. Their automatic fueling system is still not working properly. The Loco's tanks are running very low. We're going to have to stop somewhere to put some fuel in. Cookie doesn't have to wait long. There's another train on coming and controllers have pulled them into a siding to let it pass. They have just a few minutes to manually pump fuel. But Ryan has discovered the situation's worse than they thought. Neither of them are working now. They've both stopped working in auto. Before, it was only the pump on one of the tanks that was playing up. Now, there's double trouble. So we just got to pump as much in as we can every time we stop. Uh, and if we start getting real low, we're just going to have to make a stop to pump fuel. It's frustratingly slow. I have to manually hold my finger on the button. Uh, it's just a safety thing, so we don't overflow the tanks. We have to manually stand here and hold the button in. Ryan is standing next to the main line. With the other train due soon, he can't stay there too long. This is a tight cross as well, so we're not going to be able to get much in. It's a very time-consuming process. I said we might only get a thousand litres in the back engine at the moment. So we're going to have to stop again later and take fuel. And that's going to delay us. They can't let the Loco's fuel tanks run too low. If the engine starts sucking up dirty diesel, they could fail. 
Ryan needs to radio the other train to see where it is, while Cookie takes over the fuel pumping. The button's on the main line side, so be careful. And give us a call when he gets close. I can see he's had light here. He can't be far away. Ryan has to wait in the pitch black on his own. At least he hopes he's on his own. You always got to be a little bit careful of cattle and stuff like that running around though. You never know what they're doing. A lot of blokes have been scared by them. <laughs> like kangaroos jumping past. You just can't see them. But yeah, we are out in the middle of nowhere, that's for sure. You wouldn't want to hurt yourself. Like you, You've got to be a little bit careful. If I got bitten by a snake right now, it's going to take a long time to get help. Because you'd be in a lot of trouble. But maybe when you're out in the nub or maybe dingoes, getting run over by a mob of cows. Apart from that, I think we're pretty safe. The driver of the other train radios his position. SV7 PM9, just call the location this time, fellas. Yeah, no worries, mate, thanks for that. We're on the loop, you're right, come through. So here it comes, he's, only, he's two and a half kilometres away. At last it arrives. The stop has allowed them to manually pump in fuel, but not enough. They can't afford to be stopped any longer. No worries, take that, mate. Have a good one. How about you, dude? 6 p.m. 9 has to get going. It's crunch time for the Fortescue Track Maintenance Team, fixing the rail line in northwestern Australia. They're racing the clock to replace a 73-metre section of track. We're just steady, steady, putting the, putting the lift in. Crucial part. This is the trickiest part of the mission. Oh, yeah, we'll just put it on those pads, mate. Three towering cranes coordinating to lower 100 tonnes of track and sleepers into exactly the right position. Pause the measurement's supposed to be from there to there, though. They're down to two hours left. So it does have to come this way. Those end of rails have to come down this end then, mate. It's more complicated than just setting the line in place. Uh, we're just wiring up the new points machine that's going in that we're taking out for the old, the old turnout. So this is the new motor that goes in. There's a switching mechanism and motor that have to be fitted so that the points work. So we haven't got the traction then, there's a chance there that the, the switch is open and the train can fall straight into the, straight off and derail. So we're talking two or three mil at times um, with our adjustments, so it's got to be pretty precise. Are you happy with the sound or do you want me to push it over a bit more? The pressure's on. This is a time for cool heads. How close is that? Mookie, just that way a bit more, is it? Yeah, yep, let's throw the rails in, guys. We just want to check for square as well. Oh, it looks pretty good. Center, center looks good. Yep, go. It sits perfectly in place. It was a big lift, so they're about 100 tonne. We just had up in the air then. Um, but the main thing was, this bit just underneath me here is square, so that's the most critical part of this, having to point the switch square, and we got it, so huge relief. You got to bang on the money. Yeah, we're happy. Now they need to make sure it stays there. In less than an hour, the world's heaviest trains are due to roll through here. Jacking it up, propping it up. As soon as we get it to the right height, we'll start uh, dropping ballast on it. Uh, the hand tamping now so it lifts the track, it also does alignment, so it will also align the track. And it's also getting consolidation of the ballast underneath the bearers, so that it'll hold the weight of the train. The Bitchy Ritchie steam train has had to make a sudden stop. There are tree branches on the line. Some 
too big to risk running a train over. It's been fairly windy overnight. But it has the potential to cause a problem, but we'll just get rid of them. OK. The train's ready to go again, but they're on a hill. Right at the top of the hill. The fire needs more coal. The engine needs as much power as they can muster. We're always uh, on the lookout for something that's uh, not normal. Something like that. It was only relatively small, but it could have been quite big and it could have got nasty for us. So we keep an eye on things, keep it all safe. Soon, the engine is puffing its way to the halfway mark, arriving at the historic station of Corn. Bang on time. These were the things you, you saw as a kid on all the TV shows and you know, all the old movies. You see the guard there with his green flag and blow on the whistle, and 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 all the kids they they, they love seeing you do this, and 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 the big kids. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's just fantastic. And here we go. A steam train out here may be a novelty, but for Ben, it's also a big responsibility. He needs to stay alert for any possible emergency. This time, the problem's on the train, not the tracks. Any system, call. Over. Roger that. Thank you, NM25. I'll check it out. The emergency signalling system has just been activated, so we've got to go and check out and make sure that everything's OK. Did you press the panic button? Anyone in your carriage? Can you find the conductor for me, please? They've pressed it in here. They pressed it in here? Yeah. Accidentally or? Yes. Accidentally, OK. Yeah. That suits me fine. Yes. <laughs> um, Andrew, anyone, everyone in your, all right in your carriage? No worries. All right, false alarm. Good. Get going again. The train is soon steaming back to home base at Port Augusta. Back on the main line, sharing it with trains from the modern era. Provides a bit of fun for the passengers. Passengers all love it. The crews of the freight trains love it. Shows us how far we've come as a, as a country in our railway. I just can't believe how eventful this trip has been today. <laughs> Workers on the Fortescue track replacement have less than an hour before the line needs to be reopened. I think time-wise, we're still just barely on the money. The new track has to be welded to the old section. And the rough joins ground back so they're perfectly smooth, all under the pressure of the clock. Half an hour to go in the, uh, the window. The last stage is calling in the tamping machine. It gets the top of the rail to the correct level so we don't get any dips in it. And it also does alignment and it vibrates the ballast underneath the bearers and then that consolidates all the ballast and then we know that we're safe. It's the machine that makes sure the track's perfectly aligned. The giant ore trains are ready to run again. They still don't have permission to roll. If the team goes over time, each minute will cost $17,000. Had a pressure off. They've done it, with just minutes to spare. A triumph, but the only way to test if they've succeeded. <laughs> is to run a train over the top. 
Set for 20 kilometres an hour for the first train, just to be sure. And then after that, we'll lift up to 40 kilometres an hour. Hundreds of wagons. The ultimate test. Happy now. I've seen that train go over. It actually increased the speed while I was travelling through there. We're pretty confident with the ride. It's a huge relief. And back to business on one of the richest railway lines in the world. We'll get some more down the port and uh, here we'll get the ships moving from there. Everybody worked well, got everything up and running. Great day, and we're knocking off on time. Cookie and Ryan have driven throughout the night. I don't know what time it is, 7 o'clock, the sun's just coming up. So this is the worst time when you're feeling most tired. They decide to leave the fuel problem until the crew change. I think we've got about another hour and a little bit to go. When they stop, Gary is quickly back working on the tankers. The train's tanks are almost drained. Well, we just got down to 2,500 litres, and you don't really want to get down below 1,500 litres because then you start having uh, pickup problems. If you get some dirty fuel in there, you'll stuff your injectors up. There's a train due to pass them in a few minutes. They're already more than an hour behind schedule, and this fuel stop is critical. We're going to manually fuel and hopefully get about five or six thousand litres in, which will be enough to get us back to Adelaide. When the other train has passed, they'll have to get moving again. And Gary should find out whether he's fixed the problem. Phil and Darren are back in the cabin closely monitoring the fuel situation that's dogged them for the whole trip. It's been a long five days, pretty exhausted. But up ahead... Hey, there's a pot of gold at the end of that road. There's a glimmer of hope on the fuel front. The running repairs at the last stop seem to have done the job. Yeah, that's excellent news. The system's working perfectly. Adelaide is only 300 kilometres away, and they should be able to make up some time. No, it's good to be going home, no doubt about that. The trip is nearly over. Four drivers have been away from home for five days, travelled more than 5,000 kilometres across the harsh emptiness of the Australian continent. Another crew will take the train on to its destination of Melbourne. But for these four, it's the end of the line. Got about four days off, so that's pretty handy. <laughs> so, and see my little fella and my wife, so that'll be good. Great to be home. It's been a good trip, five days away, and uh, we arrived here a bit late. We lost a bit of time, but yeah, I'm looking forward to getting home and going to bed in a bed that doesn't move.